All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, are there any questions or concerns regarding anything we've discussed so far? Right, so we have seen simplex uh, using dictionaries, and in the last lecture, we talked about canonical forms, which is basically the same as dictionaries. It's just um, instead of writing in um, the you know equations as we were writing, we are just writing down in a matrix and vector format. The main thing from last time was really uh, if you have a feasible basis, how do you convert your LP? into canonical form with respect to that basis, right? And so you can use this proposition that we proved uh, via an example uh, that tells you how to convert any linear program into canonical form. And if you have canonical form, then you can write down a dictionary and you can run the simplex method and uh, find an optimal solution if there exists one. Okay. Um, what we haven't addressed so far is what if you don't even have a feasible basis? Or more generally, what if you don't even know whether your LP is feasible or not? In that case, what do you do? Right. And uh, we took a specific example, which is written here, and I've also written it on the next page. So let me just move to the next page. So we are considering this particular example and if you just look at this LP, it's not even clear whether it has a basic feasible solution, right? For which you could write a dictionary and then you could run the simplex method. So that's a problem. So how are we going to fix this? Uh, maybe some of you have already come up with the answer. First of all, let's just do the first step that we also did last time is let's make sure that the right hand side is non-negative, right? So, of course, multiplying any constraint by minus one is not going to change the LP really. It's going to be another LP which is equivalent to the original LP, right? So, I'm going to multiply the first constraint by minus one. Okay. All right, so we haven't done anything uh, really spectacular. So let's call this our LP. Okay, so I'm going to call it LP. Why not? But even this one, you can't just look at it and tell me whether it's feasible or not, right? Unless you do more work, you won't be able to figure that out. So what we want to do is, we want to write down a new LP. And we are going to call it an auxiliary LP, as is often done in the text for the material. So we want to write an auxiliary LP. Let's call it aux LP. And we want it to have certain properties that I discussed in the last lecture. So I'll just repeat them briefly. So the first thing we want is that this auxiliary LP should be feasible. In fact, you should just be able to look at it and conclude that it is feasible. Second thing we want is that it should not be unbounded. Well, that basically means that it has an op optimal solution. And finally, we want its optimal value to tell us whether the original LP is feasible or not. In particular, we will make it happen so that uh, the optimal value of auxiliary LP is equal to zero if and only if, let me say it has optimal value zero, if and only if the original LP is feasible. Okay. So these are the desired properties of the auxiliary LP. 
Okay. Essentially, it's a nice trick that I think Danzig came up with. Okay. So does anybody have any ideas as to how you would do this? Was anybody able to figure out how you would write your auxiliary LP? No suggestions, nothing. Okay, I'll give you a hint. Maybe I will write down the constraints for you and you tell me what the objective function should be. Okay, so. We are going to take the same constraints, except that we are going to force two new variables. We are going to call them uh, auxiliary variables. They are also called artificial slack variables. Uh, one per constraint. So for the first constraint, I'll put a new variable X4. And for the second constraint, I'll put a new variable X5. Okay. So my new... Um, Okay, so maybe let me make this. All right, let me just put it down. One, two, minus one. Uh, one minus one, one. And I'm putting the first X4 in the first constraint and X5 in the second constraint. And I want the right hand side to be the same, which is one, three. And I'm still going to require my all my variables to be non negative. And I want you to tell me what I should write here. Let me just make it a bit smaller so that you can see everything on one screen. So this is for the variable X4 and this is for the variable X5. So what should I do in the objective function. Maybe I'll also tell you that I'm first going to write it down as a minimization problem. What should I minimize so that if I can bring it down to zero, I will have a feasible solution to the original LP. Uh, zero, yeah. zero, 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 one, one times X. Uh, okay, can you tell me in words what that is? Like uh, the two auxiliary variables. Uh, exactly. X4 plus X5 you mean, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm not sure if some or both. Uh, some, right? I think that's what when you say zero, 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 one, one. Um, that uh, yeah. basically means the sum, right? And individually also zero because both are greater than equal to zero. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So if we can minimize x4 plus x5, and if we can bring it down all the way to zero, which you should observe is the best possible, then um, basically that, if you forget x4 and x5, and you plug it in the original LP's constraints, you will have a feasible solution, right? So observe that if this is my auxiliary LP, let's check all the properties. Clearly it is feasible. X4 equal to one, X5 equal to three, and everything else is zero, right? It is going to not be unbounded because the minimum value can be zero, right? You, the, the most you can minimize X4 plus X5 is zero. You can't take it down to minus one, for example. So clearly zero is a bound. 
and therefore it is not unbounded. And in particular, if you get a solution whose value is equal to zero, a feasible solution for this auxiliary LP whose value is equal to zero, that means that X4 and X5 are both zero. And therefore, if you just truncate the solution to three variables, one, two, and three, that will give you a feasible solution to the original LP. Right? And if you cannot bring down the value to zero, let's say the minimum you can do is uh, 0 0.5. Well, that just means that the original LP is not feasible because if the original LP is feasible, you can take any feasible solution and make a feasible solution for this LP by putting X4 and X5 to be equal to zero. Right? Are there any questions or concerns at this point? Does everybody agree that the auxiliary LP, as we have written it down, actually satisfies all the three desired properties? Okay. All right, so that's exactly what we are going to do. Um, of course, we don't like this because we have a standard form, but it's a minimization problem. That we can fix easily, right? We can turn it into a maximization problem by multiplying the objective function by minus one. So we will do that. So it's going to be maximize minus x4 minus x5 subject to the same constraints. All right. Okay, so notice that uh, B equal to 4, 5 is a feasible basis because you have a basic feasible solution associated with it, which is 0, 0, 0, 1, 3, right? Or if you like like this, okay? So this is the corresponding solution and it is a basic feasible solution because you have three non zeros, which will be your non basic variables. And uh, these two columns clearly they form the identity matrix. Therefore, this is um, 4 comma 5 is in fact a basis, right? And the corresponding solution is feasible because the right hand side is non negative. Is this in canonical form? for this basis. Can you write down a dictionary or do you need to do something else? Right, so auxiliary LP can also refer to this and it can also refer to this. It doesn't really matter, they are equivalent. Okay, my question is, is this in canonical form, which basically means a dictionary format, if you like, for the feasible basis four five. We still have to modify C. We need to modify the objective function, right? Because we want the objective function to be entirely in terms of the non basic variables x1, x2, and x3. So, no, we need to. Rewrite the objective function in terms of the non basic variables, which are x1, x2, x3 in this case. Okay, so there are multiple ways to do this. Well, at least two ways to do it. Either you apply the proposition 2.4 that we did last time, or you can just use some simple trick. Can anybody tell me what is a simple trick here? either use proposition 2.4 for which you will have to compute the inverse of some matrix and blah, 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 or simple tricks. So I'm going to do simple tricks because I don't want to compute inverses of matrices. Can you tell me a simple trick to do this by looking at this uh, linear program? 
let's actually start writing down the dictionary. So that will already tell you how to go about it. So the first dictionary, uh, we are going to put the Z and the basic variables X4 and X5, everything in terms of the non-basic variables. Oh, but X4 and X5, you already have it, right? Because we have the identity matrix. So it's one minus X1 minus two X2 plus X3. Let me know if I make any mistakes. And X5 is three minus X1 plus X2 minus X3. I need to write Z4 in terms of X4 and X2 and X3, right? Does everybody see how to do it now? Right? Yeah, you already know how to write X4 and X5 in terms of X1, X2, X3. So we can just add these two columns and take the negation, right? Okay, so we get a minus four, minus X1, minus X1, minus two X1, and negation would be plus two X1, minus two plus one is minus one, negation is plus one, plus minus zero, negation is zero. Okay, so we have minus four plus two X1 plus X2. Okay, so that is our first dictionary for the basis four, five. And now, of course, you can do it yourself. This is uh, the same simplex stuff that we have seen before. You have a dictionary and you just find out the entering variable, leaving variable, and you write down the next dictionary. So I'm not going to do those steps. Uh, so the simple tricks we used are just here. Okay, so I'll give it to you as a do it yourself. Um, solve this LP and I'll tell you what you will find uh, so that you can check later. So you will get the basis one five. Also, whenever I'm choosing an entering variable or a leaving variable, if there is a tie, I choose the one which has lowest index. This is called Bland's rule and it makes sure that simplex terminates. I don't think we'll be proving that in this course because it's kind of orthogonal to what we are trying to achieve. And uh, it might not actually be that insightful. Uh, I might prepare some notes for it, but anyways, let's just talk about that later. Okay, so we are using Bland's rule everywhere. Whenever there is a tie, you choose the one with the lower index, right? So if there's a tie between Xi and I, Xj, where I is less than J, you choose Xi, okay? So if you do that, the next basis is going to be one five, and finally you will get a basis one three, and the dictionary for this basis, uh, this is B1, and these are B2 and B3. Let's call this B1. Okay. Um, and the dictionary you get is Z equal to minus X4 minus X5. X1 equal to 2 minus half X2 minus half X4 minus half X5. Actually, I don't need to write down the whole thing. Um, maybe I should. Uh, 1 plus 3 over 2 x2 plus half x4 minus half x5. Okay, this is the last dictionary. So what can you conclude at this point? What would you conclude at this point? Is this optimal or unbounded? I mean, it can't be unbounded anyways, right? We already know that because the auxiliary LP was written so that it will always have an optimal solution, right? So 
and already at this point you can look at this and you can conclude that this is in fact optimal right because the value of the current basic feasible solution is exactly zero and the maximum value this can attain is in fact zero for any other solution um I mean, zero is an upper bound, right? So you can't do better than zero. Okay. All right. So we have solved the auxiliary LP, and it is exactly what we expected. We knew that the auxiliary LP has an optimal solution. So there is, there is no way we could have concluded that the auxiliary LP, for example, is unbounded, right? So we knew we were going to terminate with an optimal solution, and now we have an optimal solution and its value is zero. So what does this tell us about the original LP? Is the original LP feasible or is it infeasible? Uh, feasible, sorry. feasible, right? And what is a feasible solution? Can you tell me? 201. 201, exactly. So at this point, we know that 201, which is simply a truncation of this solution, is a feasible solution for the original LP. And in fact, a basic feasible solution for the same basis, for basis 1, 3. Right? So now we go back to the original LP. Remember, this is our original LP after multiplying by one of the constraints by minus 1, right? So let's look at this LP and notice that 201, if you plug it in here, you actually have a feasible solution as expected. Right? So this completes the end of what is called phase one. So what we are doing today is called the two phase simplex method. Because in the first phase, we are going to solve the auxiliary LP and conclude whether the original LP is feasible or infeasible. If it's infeasible, then you're done. Otherwise, you go to phase two, and now you solve the original LP uh, and conclude whether it is optimal or unbounded. Right. So now let's go back to the original LP, and let me just copy paste. All right, so this is basically end of phase one. And here we have phase two begins. Of course, you do a phase two only if you conclude that the original LP is feasible. Otherwise, you're done, right? All right, so let's copy paste the original LP here. All right, let me make it a bit bigger. Okay. So, all right, so we've got a feasible basis, B equal to one three is our starting feasible basis, and we want to write down uh, in canonical form with respect to this basis. Okay, so again, you can do, um, you can apply proposition 2.4, or you can do some simple tricks.
Okay, so of course I'm going to choose the easy way out. Uh, I'm just going to do some simple tricks, right? So it turns out we want to write in the basis for one three, right? So it turns out you can look at the last dictionary from the previous phase and already get x one and x three in terms of uh, x two by setting x four and x five to zero. Okay, this works. So let's do that. So we already have x1 is equal to 2 minus half x2. And x3 is equal to um, 1 plus 3 over 2 x2. Okay. And now I should just be able to plug in into the original objective function, right? This is our objective function. So I should just be able to plug in x1 and x3 in terms of x2 and get everything in terms of x2, right? So z is equal to 2x1 minus x2 plus 2x3. And that is basically two times, what do I have? Two minus half x2. minus x2 plus 2 times x3, which is 1 plus 3 over 2 x2. And this is um, 4 minus x2 minus x2 plus 2 plus 3 x2. Let me know if I make any mistakes. I am prone to those. And this is 4 plus x2, oh sorry, that is 6 plus x2. Okay, so that's our first dictionary for phase 2. So let's just write it down here. z is equal to 6 plus x2. And this is our All right, and well, at this point, uh, I think this example has only two dictionaries, so I can just uh, probably write it down. It's not a big deal. Give me one second. Um, yeah, yeah, it's just a single, so let's just do it, right? I mean, let's just see one small example, why not? So clearly, we have only one choice for the entering variable. Uh, and how much can we increase it by? I also have one more question. Uh, under what circumstances would you be able to conclude that this LP is unbounded? I mean, this one is not, but if something happens, then you can conclude that it is unbounded. Can someone tell me? When can you conclude? Or maybe change some coefficient to conclude that the LP is unbounded. Sorry, this is a bit of an aside because uh, I got excited about it. So can anyone tell me what coefficient would you change here so that the LP would become unbounded. Uh, minus half to plus half. Sure, exactly. You change minus half x2 here, and you replace minus half by any um, non-negative coefficient. Is that right? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, so that would include zero or any positive number, right? And if you do that, what do you observe? You can keep increasing x2, and there is no can no bound on x2. There is no upper bound imposed by the two constraints below. Because if you keep increasing x2, x1 and x3 are just going to increase. They're not going to become negative, right? So that would be a case where you could conclude that the LP is unbounded. Uh, however, this LP is not in that situation. Okay, so that's that. This is just an aside. 
Okay. So in this case, we are going to increase X2 and how much can we increase it by? We, we don't want X1 to become zero, right? So we can increase X2 up to two, right? Or sorry, four, right? Two minus four over two would be two minus two, which would be zero. So we can increase X2 to four, right? And that would mean that X1 will become uh, zero, right? And so X1 is our leaving variable. So X2 enters and X1 leaves. Okay, also I want to make one more comment. This whole thing about one variable entering and another variable leaving, this is also called pivoting. You might have heard this term in your linear algebra. So it's the same concept. So this, uh, how to choose an entering variable and how to choose your leaving variable, that is called pivoting. And Bland's rule is a pivoting rule, which makes sure that simplex will terminate in a finite number of iterations. It will not get into some kind of cycle or loop. Okay, so just to comment. So let's write down the new dictionary because it turns out that it is the final one. So we have the new dictionary with basis um, instead of one three, we are going to have two three. Okay, and I'm not going to do all the substitutions. I already did it uh, before the lecture. So if you do the computations, you will get the following dictionary: z equal to ten minus two x one, x two equal to four minus two x one, and x three equal to seven minus three x one. Okay. And at this point, you look at this here, you can see that no variable can be increased. This is actually um, an upper bound on the optimal value, right? 10 is an upper bound and you have a solution whose value is exactly equal to 10. And what is that solution? It is 0, 4, 7. To the original LP. Right. Let's just go back to the original LP and make sure everything is okay. So here is your original LP. Plug in zero four seven, and uh, yeah, you get equality in the first one, and you get minus four plus seven equal to three in the second one, and the objective value is minus four plus fourteen, which is equal to ten. Okay, so looks like we did not make any arithmetic mistakes. Value equal to 10, and this is your optimal solution. Right, so this is end of phase two. All right, so just to do a quick recap, which I actually wrote down in the last lecture. Uh, let's just take a quick look at this chart here. So given any arbitrary LP, uh, if you don't see a feasible solution, or more importantly, if you don't see a feasible basis, what you want to do is you want to write down an auxiliary LP. And solving it will tell you whether the original LP is feasible or not. Right? If the optimal value of the auxiliary LP is not zero, the original LP is infeasible, you are done. Otherwise, it is zero and you write down a dictionary for your original LP for the feasible basis that you found from phase one, right? And now you solve your original LP and you conclude whether it is unbounded or optimal. At this point, if we can prove, which we are probably not going to do in this course, that simplex always terminates in a finite number of steps using a Bland's pivoting rule, then it would also prove the fundamental theorem of linear programming, right? Because this algorithm always terminates with three possibilities. And so every linear program has to fall into one of these three possibilities. So uh, using Bland's pivoting rule, which is very simple, uh, always choose 
lowest index variable when there exists a tie for both entering and leaving variables. Yeah. Uh, simplex terminates. Um, and this implies that the fundamental theorem of linear programming holds. So this we haven't proved. Let me just say I haven't decided yet. Um, it's not really in line with other things we are going to do in the course, and it might take a significant uh, time, maybe one or two lectures. So at this point, I'm not sure if I want to do it. What I might do is I might prepare some notes that you can go through um, whenever you find convenient, but it will be beyond the syllabus, right? So proof, um, let me just say, for now. Okay. So I don't have good notes for it already from my previous uh, teaching of linear programming because uh, it's generally not covered in most courses because it's a bunch of notation and it might require us to first formally write down the simplex method, right? Which I haven't done in the lectures. I have put some notes on Piazza where in the last section I actually write down the algorithm formally, but I hope that you can actually formalize it yourself now that you can solve examples. Right? So it's not the formalizing it is not that difficult. It just requires some meticulous uh, choice of notation and figuring out all the steps, right? But I think the examples convey a lot more than the formal writing of the algorithm. But in any ways, the formal write-up is there on Piazza in the PDF that I uploaded. So I would recommend that you go through it as well. Okay. So that's basically the end of Simplex. Are there any questions or concerns at this point regarding Simplex? Okay. Um, all right. So I, I am calling this module simplex and certificates. So you might be wondering what certificates is about. So I want to start with certificates. Uh, let's see. We have another ten minutes today. So let's start with a new page. All right. So. Um, Okay, so here is the um, sort of idea. So, of course, if you have some linear program, you can just run the simplex method on it, right? It will terminate in a finite number of steps. It's not polynomial. Uh, there is no proof that simplex terminates in polynomial time, depending on uh, whatever pivoting choose uh, rule you apply, right? So. Whether it will terminate in polynomial time or not, it depends on the pivoting rule. But so far, we don't know of any pivoting rule which achieves that. Okay. Uh, however, in practice, simplex turns out to be extremely efficient. So the vast majority of industrial applications actually use simplex, and they don't use the theoretically polynomial time provable methods, uh, such as the interior point method, or the ellipsoid method, which are beyond the scope of this course, right? So there are theoretically provable polynomial time methods. It's just that in practice, they are not actually very efficient, um, ironically, right? So most of the industrial applications actually use a simplex method. 
Okay. Um, that being said, if you want to convince somebody that a given linear program is uh, unbounded or infeasible or has an optimal solution, of course, you could run the simplex method or any of the other methods and uh, show them the whole algorithm, how it runs, and they will be convinced if they follow the entire algorithm that it is indeed unbounded or infeasible or optimal, whatever the case may be, right? But there is an interesting question. Can we actually find some nice certificates rather than making somebody go through the entire algorithm and follow all the steps? Is there some short certificate to convince a person that a given linear program is uh, unbounded, for example? OK, so this is the idea it uh, you might be able to relate this now to our discussion in the module one about P and P and co and P. So what I'm really asking is, can we find short NP and co and P certificates to convince someone that a given LP is unbounded? OK, so I'm not going to write down everything in terms of NP and co and P. I hope that uh, we have had enough discussion about NP and co NP that you can translate this for yourself. Okay, I want to focus on the actual uh, linear algebra behind it. Okay, so I want to start with an unbounded example. And in fact, I'm going to show you a simplex example once again. Without doing all the steps, so I'll just write down the first and last dictionaries and uh, we will discuss why it is unbounded. And I will give it to you as a try it yourself problem. If you can come up with a certificate. Okay, so here is the example I have in mind. All right. Maximize minus 1, 1, 3, 0, 0. X subject to the following constraints. Uh, this is already in uh, canonical form. Okay. Uh, so that means we can directly write down the dictionary, right? We already see a feasible basis, 4 comma 5. And we can write down the dictionary for this z equal to something, x4 equal to something, x5 equal to something. Right? I'm not going to write it down. You copy it down from here. Okay. And let's just write down the objective function. Uh, everything else we can skip. So what is the objective function? It is minus x1 plus x2 plus 3x3. Right? So clearly you can increase uh, x2 or x3. And one of the variables will leave and you can proceed in this way, right? So it turns out that actually there is only uh, two iterations. Why not? So after four, five, the next one you will get is two, five. So four will leave and uh, two will enter. And the dictionary for this one, I'm going to write down it completely. So this one is as follows 1 plus x1 minus x3 minus x4 1 plus 2x1 minus 4x3 minus x4 and this is 2 plus x1 minus 3x3 plus x4. Okay, so can anybody tell me what do we do at this point? Can we write down another dictionary with a better solution or should we stop for some reason?
I mean, uh, X1 could go arbitrarily high now. So. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So it's unbounded. Is that right? So uh, yes. exactly. So you would choose X1 to be your entering variable. The problem is if you look at the coefficients here, they are all non negative plus two and plus one in this case. Right? So you can keep increasing X1 and uh, you will keep getting feasible solutions, right? And therefore, you can increase the optimal value. You can find a feasible solution for any um, optimal value you like, right? So you, for any value K, you can find a feasible solution whose value is greater than K, right? So this is an example where you conclude by looking at this column here. unbounded. Right? So, of course, if you start from this LP, this is a very small example by design. Uh, but if you want to convince someone that this LP is unbounded, you will have to show them all the steps of the simplex method. They will have to agree that, OK, fine, everything seems correct. And in the end, you get a dictionary, which by looking at that dictionary, you are convinced that the LP is indeed unbounded. Right? But can we do something smarter? Can we, instead of going someone, go through the entire process of simplex, just show them a vector? That look at this vector and convince yourself that the LP is unbounded. So that is what I want you to do. So I want you to look at this dictionary and come up with a vector d, it's a direction vector in, uh, if you want to think about it geometrically, uh, such that d immediately proves that given LP, so let's call this LP, um, yeah, let's just call it LP. Why not? It's a new page. So the given LP is indeed unbounded. Okay, so that is for this example. And in general, I want you to think about if you can generalize this for all uh, LPs in standard equality form. Can you generalize this? to all LPs in standard equality form. In particular, what do I mean? What, what are the desired properties of this vector? So that if you have such a vector, then you can easily convince someone that the given linear program is indeed unbounded. So what general properties should such a uh, vector D satisfy. Okay, so this is for the unbounded stuff. Um, we will also look at, so we will look at the certificate tomorrow because we are already at 550. And I'm starting with unbounded because I feel that it is one of the easiest certificates to understand. Uh, there are also similar certificates that we'll be discussing tomorrow um, regarding uh, infeasible LPs and also for optimal LPs. Uh, however, the optimal one especially, but in general certificates are also tied with duality. So I'm planning to cover the certificate of optimality in the next module, which is uh, one of the very important modules where we will be discussing and proving LP duality. Okay, so I want to focus on the things which are more relevant to the uh, module five as well, which is the primal dual algorithm for algorithms for combinatorial optimization problems, which is why I want to focus quite a bit on duality and I don't want to spend so much time on proving technicalities like the simplex method with plans rule terminates, right? But if I find the time for it, I will try to prepare some notes for it and uh, circulate with all of you. If you are curious to know about that. 
Okay. All right, so that's all for today's lecture. I'm here for another 10 minutes in case there are any questions or concerns.